So now with Pelini dropping out, Rick Perry dropping in, and Michelle Bachman and Ron Paul dominating the AIM straw poll, we got ourselves a race. We have a top tier. It is Mitt Romney, Rick Perry, and Michelle Bachman. We have a new top tier, and it's Perry, Mitt Romney, and Bachman. There's now a top tier in this race, at least for now, of Romney, Perry, and Bachman. I mean, I think that's fair to say. Really fair to say? You're not forgetting, I don't know, anyone, say an ideologically consistent 12-term congressman who came within less than 200 votes of winning the straw poll? Isn't anyone going to give that gentleman a little love? There's a top tier now of, of, of Bachman and Perry and Romney, and, you know, we haven't mentioned, and we should... Thank you! We haven't mentioned, and we should, Rick Santorum, who did really surprisingly well for the amount of money and resources he had. Rick Santorum? He didn't get half of what Ron Paul got. He lost to the guy who lost so bad he dropped out of the race. Santorum? We're looking at Mitt Romney, who continues to be the front runner, but we have Rick Perry as well, and now Michelle Bachman. Let's not count out John Huntsman, though. What? John Huntsman? Huntsman got 69 votes. If if all of John Huntsman's supporters met at the same Ames, Iowa Quiznos, the fire marshal would say, yeah, that's fine, no problem. There's still some tables open in the back. Huntsman, Huntsman was the only Mormon running in the straw poll, and he came in second amongst Mormons. And by the way, this pretending Ron Paul doesn't exist for some reason has been going on for weeks. A new Gallup survey showing Rick Perry running second to Mitt Romney, knocking down Iowa favorite Michelle Bachman to fourth. Behind who? Fourth behind who? How did libertarian Ron Paul become the 13th floor in a hotel? Why? What's wrong with... He is Tea Party patient zero. All that small government grassroots business, he planted that grass. These other folks, they're just moral majorities in a tri-cornered hat. Ron Paul's the real deal, and Fox News should love this guy. But watch the disconnect between the debate moderators at Fox's Thursday debate and the debate audience. Iran does not have an air force that can come here, just like we did in Iraq, build up the war propaganda. There was no al-Qaeda in Iraq, and they had nuclear weapons, and we had to go in. I'm sure you supported that war as well. Yeah. Okay. It's time we quit this. It's time. It's trillions of dollars we're spending on these wars. <laughs> What's with the smirk and the eye roll? The, guy gives it, the crowd goes nuts, and you do one of these. There goes crazy Uncle Ron, babbling about the unsustainability of multiple wars. Boop, boop. He's the one guy in the field, agree with him or don't dis uh, agree with him, who doesn't go out of his way to regurgitate talking points or change what he believes to fit the audience he's in front of. And you're treating him like if this were Celebrity Apprentice, he'd be this guy. By the way... At the Ames Iowa straw poll, Busey beat Huntsman 77 to 69. And even when the media does remember Ron Paul, it's only to reassure themselves how there's no need to remember Ron Paul. Right now, live, right next to the bus behind us, Ron Paul is speaking. And seven of the candidates are here today. We have live pictures of Ron Paul, but you know what? We're talking about Sarah Palin and we're talking about Rick Perry, the two people not in the race yet, Drew. And guess what, Paul? If you get video of Sarah Palin or get a soundbite from her, bring that back to us. You can hold the Ron Paul stuff. <laughs> So we've been talking about uh, John Oliver's, uh, what I consider to be a dishonest smear job on a third party, although he paid lip service to we need third parties, and then he did the underhanded attacks on Jill Stein. And um, so let's just, uh, I'm here with Dave Anthony. Dave Anthony, you know him from the dollop pop. Podcast. Hey, Dave. Hi. All right. And... Uh, so here, let's just, uh, so here's some more, and his whole framing is wrong. 
right? So well, I've told you this before. When someone on the left wants to debate someone on uh, to to their left, they first smear them, and that's what John Oliver's doing. He didn't take Jill seriously, and he's using all these little techniques to uh, bait and switch you. And well, here, let's watch. Here, here, first of all, he doesn't understand the whole thing, and here, here's proof. In America's third parties, because when your two main options are depressing, any third choice seems good. No, that's not true, John. When your first ma two main options are depressing, and a third option is, say, Ted Cruz, they're all depressing. Hey, let's say your option is Hillary Clinton or Don Trump, Don Tiny Hands Trump, and your third option is Sarah Palin. Ah, it doesn't look good. Hey, let's say your third option. So, no, you're just wrong. That's just wrong. So yep. that's just a wrong framing. No, if your two first options are horrible, the third option looks good if it's a good option. Okay. Okay. If you're, in, if you're at a, a KFC Taco Bell and you see a bunch of pigeons eating something in the parking lot, you might well think, hang on, what have they got over there? So now what he's doing is he's saying that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are the Taco Bell and KFC, and Jill Stein's policies, which are fantastic, are the equivalent of bird seed. That's what he just did. That's like, he, and he's not embarrassed, by the way. He's doing it with a straight face, and the sycophants in his audience are laughing along because they don't realize what he's doing. He's doing it very quickly and very deft. He's a very good comedian. He knows how to deliver it. But what he's delivering here is propaganda. This yeah. is not comedy, right? Because this is he's using comedy to disinform you because what he should have did, if you were inside of a Taco Bell and a KFC and you looked outside and you saw maybe a Chipotle, Maybe there's a whole food. If Jill Stein is supposed to be those birds, right. that's not right. Jill Stein would be maybe a Whole Foods or a, or a Chipotle. I'd go, oh, I don't want to be at this Taco Bell or this KFC. Maybe I'll go over to the, the Whole Foods and I'll get a, a whole uh, a organic chicken wrap. Is this is this segment called Punching Down? This is called Punching doing? Down. <laughs> well, this is called This is the ultimate example of Punching Down. With with Taco Bell and 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 KFC, as the comparisons to to the third party Jill Stein, a punching down, punching down. So what what he so no what we could do is we could look out the window and we could see a better restaurant and that's what I look when I see Jill Stein. But John doesn't care because John doesn't eat at at KFC or Taco Bell and he certainly isn't going to eat the bird seed. He's a freaking millionaire. He's got a private chef. So, so what he doesn't do is say the menu. Because so what he's really saying, so if this is Clinton and that's Donald Trump and that's Jill Stein, let's look at the menu, right? So let's look at Jill Stein's menu. Her first menu is she will cancel all college student debt. That, but that's a that's a great idea if you don't want the economy to derail. <laughs> So what John what John Oliver says is that she's kooky crazy because you can't just cancel it with quantitative easing. That's not you can't you can. He's wrong. He doesn't even understand how quantitative easing works. Uh, he, uh, we're gonna, which is another video. We're gonna do that later. But right now, I'm just gonna say uh, she will cancel college student debt, which is about a trillion dollars. Hillary Clinton voted for the Iraq War, which is I don't know four trillion now, six trillion. It's gonna be eighty trillion. So again, she's so stupid. She's not gonna vote for a frickin' war that costs trillions. But she will vote to give us student loan relief, which we could so totally afford. Go ahead, Jimmy. Jimmy. Uh MSNBC did something pretty crazy the other day. They finally revealed their true colors. The truth about their efforts to manipulate this election for Hillary Clinton against Bernie Sanders, that, that, that truth, that reality, accidentally sprayed out of Chris Matthews' out-of-control face holes. I'm told by the experts on numbers around here at NBC and elsewhere that come uh, June 7th, the day of the California primary, which your candidate, I, I totally understand, wants to get to and maybe have a chance of knocking off Hillary at that event, a big last hurrah, that at 8 o'clock that night Eastern time, uh, the networks will be prepared, including this one, to announce that Hillary Clinton has now gotten over the top, that she will have won the nomination in numbers.
It's done. What will that do to turn out if that's five o'clock Pacific time with three more hours to vote in California? Who will be least likely to vote? Sanders people from five to eight people or Hillary? I've heard both theories. First of all, by even asking this question in this way, by phrasing like this, Matthews is hoping to suppress voting. He is saying, we already know it's over. We're going to announce it's over. Don't vote. All right. Number two, he's admitting that MSNBC plans to fraudulently declare a winner. Hillary Clinton absolutely will not be the winner on June 7th because superdelegates don't vote until the convention. You got it, Chris? You get it? So unless, so unless Bernie Sanders disappears because he got back into his time machine and returned to whichever future civilization <laughs> sent him here to try desperately to save us from a little unless unless that happens hillary will not get the nomination on june 7th three matthews is also admitting that msnbc's announcement will likely influence the vote in california he's saying Hey, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, so, so we're gonna, we're gonna f in California. How you feel about that? Is that cool? Not cool? <laughs> and Bernie's campaign manager, Jeff Weaver, then tried to explain to Matthews that he has the mental capacity of beef jerky. <laughs> and that superdelegates are not counted yet. All we have from superdelegates is essentially a poll. You aren't allocating delegates based on a poll in California, yeah. but you are allocating delegates based on a poll of superdelegates. Jeff, okay, okay, I don't want to have this conversation. No, no. Why would you? Why would you? I, I don't want to have this conversation. I don't want to talk about how the entire premise of everything I'm saying is stupid. I don't. Nope, not one bit. MSNBC, I, are, you, are you guys involved in some kind of wager as to whether it's possible for you to make Fox News look smart? Because I think you could win it. I think you could win. Moving. Welcome. This week, I'm going to show you mind-blowing video of how the voting machines were rigged in Chicago and possibly many other cities. And I realize this is like the third show recently where I've talked about how the primaries are being stolen, but this is the theft of our democracy. It's not like this is the third week I've covered how cucumber was. Was he bought off by Big Cucumber? This is <laughs> terrible. But this week, I have video from the Chicago Board of Elections that brings into question everything we've seen in these primaries. In Illinois, it's mandatory that they recheck 5% of the vote to see if the machines are operating correctly. And people can go and witness this audit. They can watch as the machines are tested. And you know, Saturday night free, do you go to the UFC fight or voting machine audit? So, <laughs> so here is what those witnesses saw. Essentially in the audit, they were erasing votes that the electronic voting machine paper record indicated had been cast. So the hand tally showed that uh, Bernie Sanders had gotten 223 votes and that um, Hillary Clinton had gotten 49, 46 less votes. The hand tally showed that. Okay. But to meet the official recommended results, they had to literally erase Bernie Sanders' votes and add Hillary Clinton's. <laughs> That's approximately 70 votes, 70 times about 500 uh, uh, active machines in the field. And there's more that we have uh, documented here. It is a lot of votes. What they're describing is election fraud. Person after person walked up to that podium and said the machines got the votes wrong and the auditors covered it up. And I'm sure the Chicago Board of Elections officials and the people at those little tables were horrified at what they heard. Now that's not really the way we do an audit. I don't think that that's really a credible way of believing that we've got a fair tally. Can I just yeah. ask you, because I, I, are you... Uh, have you done audits before, or are, are you just going on? Uh, I participated in other elections. I have not done uh, audits okay. before, but because I've been in political science. Okay, because you're 
uh, you were saying that this is not the way to do an audit, and I don't just didn't know whether you had any experience previously. Ooh, lady. No. No, she's not a trained auditor. But you don't have to be to know the numbers shouldn't be changed to match what the stupid machines say. I'm not a basketball player, but I know when I see a basketball game, okay? If I saw two people rubbing their faces in a bowl of clam chowder and I said, that's not a basketball game, would you respond, are you a professional NBA ref? <laughs> then shut up. The Board of Elections was just presented with full frontal election fraud, and their response was, you don't know. <laughs> uh, apologize if, because of miscommunications or whatever, there was, you know, some, some difficulty here. And uh, I will see to it, I, and I will make it a point to spend more time during the 5% audit out at the warehouse uh, after the November election. Day. To make sure that there are any difficulties that are resolved immediately and, and we don't have to go into this. You apologize if there was a miscommunication? Yeah, the miscommunication was that you were just told the election was not legit and you responded with the same urgency as if you were told your shower isn't draining so well. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll look into that. I'll, I'll put that on a list here and file it under S for shut <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> because all of those people that spontaneously showed up, they're just like you and me. They have lives to tend to. They have they have stuff to deal with. They, you know, and they still came and took four or eight hours or more to protest outside CNN. They all have jobs to do. They have, they have papers to write and lawns to mow and children to leave in the car with their windows cracked a little bit or whatever you do with kids when you don't want them. You know? these, these protesters all have lives and don't want to spend their day trying desperately to get our news media to do their job. Just do your job, please. But they came out anyway, because, because it's gotten to a breaking point. The nation's most trusted name in news is literally covering how someone's ponytail obscured a TV on a plane. That's what CNN's official Twitter account was posting at the same time there were a thousand people outside their front door. <laughs> First of all, if someone puts their if someone puts their ponytail in front of your TV, don't you just yank the ponytail? I mean, I, it, that problem comes with its own emergency cord to fix the problem. Don't just stick your gum in the ponytail. Stuff. There's a lot of easy answers. Is all is all I'm saying. And secondly, if that ponytail was blocking CNN on the TV, you weren't missing anything. Anything. They were literally reporting on how someone created a bedroom in a shark tank. I don't know what to do with that information. I don't. I don't. How do I use? The, the, the meaning that is oozing out of your network. I don't, I, what do I, how do I process? Honey, come quick. There's a bedroom and a shark tank. Get ready. I don't. Isn't that odd? <laughs> but in order to show she did it to help Hillary Clinton, we'd have to show she's had some kind of contact with Clinton or Clinton supporters. And, and that just, that just isn't good. Oh, what, what's this on this newspaper from 2014 that I always keep by my desk? <laughs> what? I, li I like my newspapers, old and wrinkly, like my men. <laughs> I don't know what that meant. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> In September of 2014, the Wall Street Journal wrote about a dilapidated Upper West Side brownstone that was sold to a developer. The place's floors had collapsed and stonework cracked. Over the years, neighbors complained about graffiti, garbage, and rats. One neighbor even, even put up a rat crossing sign. Anyway, <laughs> this, place, this place is a dump. Nobody would ever buy... Oh. The property sold for $6.6 million, $1.1 million over the 2013 market value. Isn't that ah? <laughs> the owner of the home is one Diane Hazlett Rudiano, who paid $5,000 for it in 1976. That's the same name as that other person. <laughs> that is odd. She wasn't even trying to sell the place. She was, she was just approached by a buyer offering six and a half million dollars. Maybe the buyer was a rat collector. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But alas, this still has nothing to do with the Clinton camp. Oh, wait. <laughs> the buyer of the property was an investment group headed by Dana Lowey Lutway, daughter of U.S. Representative Nita Lowey, a superdelegate for one Hillary. <laughs> Isn't that odd? <laughs> it says... It says here in this newspaper, which has now switched from the Wall Street Journal to the Daily News, <laughs> that... <laughs> It says that when they asked Lowey's chief of staff whether there was any potential situation at all in which Nita Lowey would switch her support from Clinton to Sanders, her chief of staff replied, absolutely not. None at all? None at all? Like Hillary could walk up on the podium with a pig's head on a necklace like a Flavor Flav clock and, <laughs> and Lowey would still be down for that? Isn't that... <laughs> So the Board of Elections chief clerk,
accidentally deletes 120,000 voters in a major primary 18 months after selling a completely destroyed house where bed bugs go to plan their revolution, <laughs> selling it for $6.6 million to the daughter of a diehard Clinton supporter. Color me pink and tickle me stupid. That is odder than a snowstorm in July. <laughs> that is odder than a porcupine with a balloon. <laughs> that is odder than a porn star at a debutante ball. That is odder than Shia LaBeouf acting not odd. <laughs> that is odder than a river otter. <laughs> That's all I got. That's all I got. <laughs> Look, I'm sure this is all on the up and up. <laughs> the Clintons would never be involved in something scandalous. <laughs> and I'm sure there was some kind if, if there was some kind of conspiracy, the mainstream media would be all over it. <laughs> Just like they were all over donating to the Clinton Foundation, including NBC, News Corp, which owns Fox News, Turner Broadcasting, which owns CNN, and Reuters. But they, they, they didn't donate for any, you know, payback. They, they just, they donated because they genuinely care whether. So guess what? There's a book out right now called Shattered. Yeah. And it's about the Hillary Clinton campaign, and it's by two insiders. And here's, here's where the Russia stuff comes from. So this is from that book. It says, the strategy had been set within 24 hours of her concession speech. Robbie Mook and John Podesta assembled her communications team at the Brooklyn headquarters to engineer the case that the election, engineer the case that the election was entirely on the up and up. No way. <laughs> <laughs> for, a, for a couple of hours, with Shake Shack containers littering the room, they went over the script they would pitch to the press and the public. Already, Russian hacking was the centerpiece of the argument. Wow, wow. So that's John Podesta, who would rather start World War III than admit he ran a ship. And that, and that, you know, they got Shake Shacks. You know what is so beautiful about Hillary Clinton going down in flames is that we didn't even have to release information that wasn't true. <laughs> wow. God bless Daddy Watson and Schultz. So get this, I was looking through WikiLeaks and I found this thing from a guy named Peter Bod Brodnitz. So he was a consultant, top line results or whatever. So they did a poll and he did research for the Hillary Clinton campaign. This is back in 2015. And so he submitted all this data. So he, they did all this research on people and they did data. And you see that red line? It, it's going down to this little thing here. And what does that say? I'll tell you what, this is an internal document from the Hillary Clinton campaign. And wait till you hear what that says. That little section there says, Secretary Clinton's top vulnerability tested in this poll is the attack that claims as Secretary of State, she signed off on a deal that gave the Russian government control of 20% of America's uranium production after investors in the deal donated over 140 frickin' million dollars to the Clinton Foundation. Her own internal document said that's her number one freaking vulnerability, and it said half of all likely voters are less likely to support Clinton after hearing that statement, and 17% are much less likely to vote support her after that statement. After voters heard a battery of negatives on Secretary Clinton, their top concern was that she does not seem honest. <laughs> that's where that rush comes from. Because it was her vulnerability. And what do all frickin' crazy right-wingers do? They do before you can accuse them of it. And that's exactly, that's where this Russia, because they did a deal for plutonium, and the Kremlin Associated Bank gave Bill Clinton a half a million dollars. They gave the Clinton Foundation over 140. This is unbelievable, and no one talks about this. You turn on MSNBC, CNN, they will never tell you about this. <laughs> did you know about that, Ro? I read about it. You read about it. Not, not in that detail. No.